Hey everyone, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. So 2020 has been a heck of a year, but I think we're at the point now where we're not gonna get any more big handheld releases for the rest of the year. So I think it's a good time to do a deep dive and kind of look at all of the big devices that have been released this year and which ones are my favorite of 2020. So I really wanna do an in-depth kind of review of these three devices, the RG350M, the RG351P, and the Retroid Pocket 2 because I really think these are the best three devices of the year, and these are the three that I get a lot of questions about. Which one should I buy? This one, this one, or that one? And so I think this guide will really help you to kind of pinpoint specifically whether or not you wanna buy a new device or whether or not you wanna to add to your inventory. Say you already have one, is it worth it to upgrade to another one? So without any further ado, let's get into it. Okay, so let's get started with the RG350M. Now this device came out in May of 2020, and it's actually an upgraded version of the RG350. Uh, this one has an aluminum shell to it, uh, but otherwise it has the same internal CPU and GPU, which is a one gigahertz MIP CPU, and then it has a GC860 GPU. Now it only has 512 megs of RAM, but it sports a 3.5 inch four by three aspect ratio screen, with a 640 by 480 pixel density. And it has a 2500 milliamp battery, which lasts about five to six hours. Okay, so now let's look at the RG351P. Now this one released in September of 2020, and this one has a quad core 1.3 gigahertz ARM CPU, which can be overclocked to 1.5. It has a Mali G31 MP2 GPU, one gigabyte of RAM, and then it also has a 3.5 inch screen, but this is a three by two aspect ratio with 480 by 320 pixels with a 3,500 milliamp battery. And finally, the Retroid Pocket 2. So this has a Cortex A7 1.5 gigahertz ARM CPU, a Mali 400 MP2 GPU, one gigabyte of RAM as well, and it has a similar screen to the RG350M, which is 3.5 inches, 4 by 3 aspect ratio, 640 by 480 pixels, and it has a 4,000 milliamp hour battery. Now that's a lot of details and a lot of statistics, so let's break this down in my favorite kind of way, which is through a Venn diagram. So we'll start here and we'll talk about each of the individual devices and what they have that's unique. The RG350M uses a Linux-based OpenDingux firmware. Uh, it has two microSD card slots, and it can play a variety of different ports, and it also has a metal case. So those are the things that are unique to this device in particular. Now the RG351P is also unique in some ways. It runs Emulation Station as its main front end. It has that 480 by 320 display and a 3 by 2 aspect ratio. The Retroid Pocket 2 runs Android, and because of that, it has Google Play Store, and you can stream things like through Steam Link and things like that, and it also has built-in Bluetooth. Now, between the 350M and the Retroid Pocket 2, they both have HDMI out. They have a 640x480 display and a 4x3 aspect ratio, which is really great for classic console games. Now the Retroid Pocket 2 and the RG351P also have some similarities. They both can use Wi-Fi, although the 351P needs to have a USB adapter. They both support NetPlay, so you can play with your friends over the internet. They also have sleep mode and a single micro SD card, and they both use a plastic case as opposed to the 350M, which has a metal case. Now between the 350M and the 351P, they both have dual analog sticks. The Retroid Pocket 2 does not have that. We'll get into that in a minute. They also have L3 and R3 buttons. So you can click on the analog sticks and they both support rumble. Now all three of these devices have USB-C as their charging port. And then they all get about five to six hours of battery life altogether. Regardless of the size of the battery, that's how much life you can expect for your device. Okay, so now that we've talked about some of the features, let's talk about the systems that they support, and we're gonna use a different diagram for this. So as you can see here, the 350M actually covers a really wide variety of games, everything from like Atari games, all the way through to PlayStation 1 games, as well as classic arcade games, old school computer games, handheld devices, and then it has, like I've mentioned before, a lot of different ports. So you can play Doom and Quake, and there's even a Super Mario 64 port that's available for it. So there are a lot of games that can be played with the 350M. 
Now the 351P can play all of those games and then some. So it can play Dreamcast and Nintendo 64 and PlayStation Portable, Nintendo DS, Virtual Boy, and then even better versions of the arcades. So they have Final Burn Neo. And then they also support some systems like Naomi, which is an arcade version of the Dreamcast, as well as 3DO. And its underlying system is actually supported by RetroArch, which gives you a lot of diversity and variety when it comes to the supported emulators. Now, more or less, the Retroid Pocket 2 can actually play all of those games as well, but it can also use Android Google Play Store games, as well as it can stream games through Steam Link and Moonlight. So you have a little bit more variety with the Retroid Pocket 2. And this isn't a perfect diagram because, for example, some games won't play on one system, but they will on another. For example, Mario 64 port will only play on the 350M. But in general, this gives you an idea that the 350M plays a little bit fewer games than the 351P, and so on and so forth with the Retroid Pocket 2. Okay, so these aren't the only handhelds out there, so I wanted to show you why it is I didn't pick other handhelds in this comparison. So first and foremost, here's the RG350P. Now this has a nice build quality to it. It's basically a plastic version of the 350M, but the reason why I didn't include it is because it has a low resolution screen. It's only 320 by 240, and that makes a big difference when you're going through the menus, especially after you're used to the 640 by 480 display. So this is why I didn't include it. Now the RG280V just came out recently, and this is a really fun handheld device, and it also plays the same kind of games that the 350M plays, but in a much smaller form factor, and it's just so fun to play and put in your pocket and whatnot, but I wouldn't recommend this as your number one personal device, right? If you're gonna have a device that you're gonna keep with you for a long time, this one isn't it. I think this is more like a novelty. Now, a lot of people say that the PS Vita is actually one of the best games for retro handheld gaming, and it doesn't really fit the mold with the rest of these systems because this is actually made to play PS Vita games, and it's not an actual emulation device, it's just been hacked to play emulation. On top of that, it's like $100 more than the other ones. And so because of that, I decided this wasn't a very good fit for a comparison, and I'll use that for future videos instead. Okay, so let's actually dive into the feel of the device and how it actually looks in the hand. So let's start with the 350M. And you can see here, it looks really nice. It feels really good in the hand. You know, being that it's aluminum, it has a very premium feel to it. As you can see, the buttons kind of stick out quite a bit from the case. And that makes it so that when you push on the D-pad and the buttons themselves, it feels really good. Like it has a nice kind of squishiness to it. It reminds me of old Nintendo game pads. You can see the analog sticks are a little bit inset into the device itself, which also has a really great feel to it. Up top, you can see it has four shoulder buttons, two USB-C ports, and then a very important HDMI port. So I really like the fact that I can plug this into my computer and capture game footage and things like that. On the bottom, you see the two SD cards and a reset button. On one side, you have the power button, and on the other side, you have your two volume buttons. But overall, I really like the feel of this device. I think that the aluminum quality of it does really make it feel very premium. Uh, and it is a bit heavy. It's about nine ounces or so. Uh, and you definitely feel that difference between the plastic devices. Okay, moving on to the RG351P. Now this has a very similar layout to the RG350M. You can see the buttons stick out just about the same as the RG350M. It also has recessed dual analog sticks. The D-pad has the same kind of feel to it, and it has the same shoulder button layout as you're expecting from the 350M. Now up top you can see it has dual USB ports, but it does not have HDMI. And on the back you can see it has the same kind of rubber padding that it does on the 350M as well. On the bottom, you can see it has a single SD card and then a reset button, as well as the speakers. And then on the right, you have a volume wheel that you actually can scroll, and I really like that feature. And then on the left, you have a power button. And that's really about it for this one. So the Retroid Pocket 2 is a little bit unique from those devices. For example, you can see the D-pad is below the left analog stick, and some of the buttons are a little bit different than what you're expecting there. So let's actually get into detail about this. Okay, for starters, you can see the left analog stick is not recessed into the device, so it sticks out quite a bit. And the right stick actually isn't even an analog stick. It's an eight-way digital nub, so it just kind of slides around. Uh, it's not very good compared to an analog stick, unfortunately. And you can also see the face buttons here. They barely stick out, and they're very clicky, and it's not a very fun experience to me, especially compared to the Ambernic devices, which have a much better feel on the buttons. 
Now, one thing I really do like about this device are its shoulder buttons. You know, it has real trigger shoulder buttons and they feel really nice when you press down on them. I like the feel of these over the Ambernick devices. Up top, you see it has a power button, volume rocker, OTG or USB-C charger, and then HDMI cable. On the sides, there really isn't anything there, but on the bottom, you can see it has a single SD card as well as the headphone jack on the bottom, which I really like. I'd prefer to have it on the bottom than on the top. Now overall with the plastic you can see it kind of feels and it looks like almost like a Game Boy plastic like it feels more like a toy than it does a premium device. It's very kind of slick plastic. Uh, it just to me feels a little bit amateurish or maybe childish especially compared to the 351p which has this kind of textured plastic on it which really really feels nice to me and makes it feel like a much more premium product. And then going back to the Retroid Pocket 2, it has the start and select buttons on the bottom as well as a home button, which is actually kind of handy. And then the speakers are actually on the bottom and they face you, which I actually like a lot because it makes it so the sound goes directly to you as opposed to the other devices, which has the sound coming out of the bottom. But yeah, overall, it kind of feels like a toy. You know, it's hard to explain, but when you hold the other devices, you feel like they're premium and this one doesn't feel like it. Overall, the 351P to me feels the most balanced. I really like the feel of it in my hand. Okay, so now let's actually discuss the user interface because you're going to spend a lot of time in this interface and it's really good to know what you're getting yourself into. Now, the RG350M uses OpenDingux, which is basically a Linux-based interface that allows you to basically have these different apps that are emulators that run your games for you. So think of them like phone apps where you're going to start up this app, you're going to navigate to wherever your games are saved, and then you're going to open it up. Now, each of these apps are independent. So again, think of it like a phone where you're going to be updating these individually and, and have whatever ones are your favorite installed. And that's basically how this is going to work because there are conflicting apps. It's not like there's a single app that'll do everything for every little system. So this is the Game Boy app here. You can see I'm going into the interface to quit it. And this is how I would change between games. Now, if I want to open up a different emulator, like for example, this is the NES emulator, it's the same kind of thing. I'm going to navigate to the game and start the game up, and then I'm going to have to go to that emulator's interface in order to exit the game. So you kind of have to memorize how all of these emulators work. So as opposed to learning one system, you really are learning a dozen different systems because each one is unique to itself. Now, in addition to that, you can also load games directly from this device. And that's because people have ported over classic computer games or other games that work perfectly for this device. Now, there's also something called front ends. And front ends basically allows you to use a different user interface to make it a little bit more user friendly. So the first one I showed you is 350 Tarek. And this one here is called Simple Menu, and this is the one I prefer. And it's basically just an interface that you would use as opposed to the OpenDingux normal interface. And you would use this to scroll through your different systems and navigate to the games you want to play. And then it's going to launch those same emulators we saw before, but you don't have to actually navigate to the game. This will load the game for you. So it's just a nicer interface that allows you to kind of have seamless integration. So for example, if we go to the NES and we pick Back to the Future and we start it up, you can see here it starts up just the way that the last game did. And to exit a game, it's the same exact process. I'm going to go into the emulator settings and then select exit. But then it's going to send me back to simple menu as opposed to back to the regular interface. Now the Retroid Pocket 2 interface is completely different. So this one is actually using Android. And so because of that, this is actually a typical Android 6.0 interface. I'm using a launcher called ATV Launcher to make these icons look a little bit nicer. But overall, this is basically like using a phone, like an Android phone, but with a controller instead. It doesn't have a touch screen or anything. But you can see here there are individual emulators. Uh, and that's what you can use for certain games, but overall I like to use RetroArch. And so I like to load this up, and then I've already created my own playlist, which I have loaded all of my games in them already, and all I have to do is navigate to the game I want, and then I can just start it right up. It's not the prettiest interface in the world, but it's very utilitarian. It works very well for me. I like having the ability to change all of my settings within RetroArch, and it works across the entire platform. But overall, the Retroid Pocket 2 interface is fairly complex because some games won't play on the RetroArch system. So for example, you don't want to play Nintendo 64 or PSP or DS games. You have to use the individual apps. And so because of that, it gets pretty complex pretty quickly. So overall, if you're familiar with how Android works, 
and you're, you don't mind learning how RetroArch works, then you're going to be just fine in the Retroid Pocket too, because you're either going to be using Android apps or you're going to be using the RetroArch system. And that's basically it for this one. Now there is a separate operating system, which I'll show you here in a minute, uh, but I actually don't recommend that one. In general, you're going to want to use the Android interface. Now the RG351P is again a completely different beast. So this one runs Emulation Station as its front end, but it uses RetroArch in the back end. So your interface is what you're navigating through is actually through Emulation Station. And it's very simple. Think of it like simple menu, but a little bit more robust because you basically pick your system and then you navigate through your games, which have like videos, which is really kind of nice and convenient. Uh, but overall, this interface is very simple. You just navigate to the game you want, and then you just push the button to start it up. It's not like with the Retroid Pocket 2 where you have to figure out which emulator to use or anything else like that. This one is just one single interface, and it figures out all the back-end stuff for you. And I'm actually using a different operating system than the one that comes with your device, and that's because this one here, which is called ArcOS, has a lot of nice user-friendly kind of upgrades and things like that. And so I've made a video already about how to install it. It's actually very easy, but I would recommend you check out that video as well, and I'll have a link below. So yeah, when you start up a game in RG351P interface, it'll just go directly to the game and it's using RetroArch in the back end there. And when you exit out of RetroArch, it's going to take you right back to the normal interface, and it turns out to be a very seamless experience. And that's one of the things I really like about the RG351P, is that the user interface is just seamless. And with the other ones, you know, you have to do a lot of work. The Retroid Pocket 2 does have different front ends that you can do to make it kind of a seamless experience, but it's not very easy. And the 350M as well takes a lot of work to get it set up, even for simple menu. So overall, I think when it comes to user interface and just the ability to jump right into a game and to jump out of it without having to feel like a computer programmer, the RG351P has the most simple interface right out of the box. Now I've already mentioned that I really like the ArcOS operating system on the 351P, and part of that is because of its screensaver function. And this will show you a series of short videos from your own game library, and all you have to do is press start and you can jump into any of those games at any time. And I really like this feature because there's often times when I see a video and I say, oh I forgot about that game, and I press start and I can start playing it immediately, and it's one of my favorite experiences on this device. Now I mentioned that the Retroid Pocket 2 has a different interface, and this is called the Retroid Operating System, and you have to basically install this on your device, but it allows you to see a bunch of preloaded games, and you can even go into what they call the game market, and you can actually download and install other games to just play right then and there. So I don't really like this game market and I don't really support it because it actually allows you to illegally download games directly onto your device. And I don't agree with that. I think you should be using copies of your own games uh, when you're playing these retro devices. And secondly, uh, it has no ability to change any settings in any of these games. You can't adjust the graphics or the controls or anything else like that. So in general, I don't recommend that operating system. So in addition to the typical emulated games that you can play on an RG350M, it's actually unique in the fact that it has a bunch of different ported games. And what this means is that somebody has taken original games and recompiled it to work specifically for the operating system that the RG350M uses. And this operating system has been around for a while, since about 2014. And so because of that, there's a lot of support out there where you can play a bunch of games that people have worked on. So for example, Doom works perfectly. You can play Quake 1, 2, and 3. And you can also even play like the computer version of Diablo on this device as well. So that's a really neat feature. Now the RG351P also allows you to play different ports, but it's not quite as robust right now, so you can only play games like Doom and Doom 2 and Quake and Wolfenstein and other games like Cave Story. And so it's not quite there yet, uh, but I think over time they'll probably add additional ports to this later on. Now one nice thing about these ports is that they actually are supported by RetroArch, which means you can change the settings and the controls on the fly, which is really nice. So the Retroid Pocket 2 is completely different. Because it uses Android and the Google Play Store, you can actually just go in there and download any game that you want, as long as it's supported by Android 6.0. Now bear in mind the fact that a lot of games in the Google Play Store are meant for a touchscreen, and the Retroid Pocket 2 does not have a touchscreen. So you need to find games that actually support button controls, or you have to use a mapper tool, and that's not very easy or fun to use. So in general, you have this option, but it's a little bit limited overall. 
Okay, so now let's actually talk about the screens themselves. Let's start with the Retroid Pocket 2. Now the first thing I noticed when I got this device was the fact that it did not have very good viewing angles. In general, you, when you turn it on an angle, it's very hard to see. Now by comparison, the 350M has much better viewing angles. And then on top of that, the 351P also has the same amount of really nice viewing angles. So I don't think this is going to make or break the deal, but it's something to be aware of is the fact that the screen quality on the Retroid Pocket 2 is not quite up there with the two Ambernic devices. Now let's talk about screen size for a minute. All three of these devices are marketed as being 3.5 inch screens, but 3.5 inches can mean different things for different screens. So for example, the top two screens, the Retroid Pocket 2 and the RG350M, both have 4x3 screens. That means that they are ideal for a lot of the classic consoles because a lot of them used a 4x3 aspect ratio because that's what was used with typical TVs back in the day. Now the RG351P uses a 3x2 screen. Now this is a little bit more widescreen of a device, and it's perfect for the Game Boy Advance, but all the other systems are going to be a little bit squished because of that, because they were developed for a 4x3 screen. Now the real difference in these screens comes when you measure the actual amount of square inches that are available for your display. Now with a 4x3 display, you're going to end up with 5.88 square inches of space. But a 3x2 display, even though it's also 3.5 inches, actually only has 5.65 square inches of space. That's about a 4% difference. So overall, when you're playing on an RG351P, you're already losing about 4% of screen space just off the bat. But in addition to that, the 3x2 display makes your display look a little bit squished. So the way to fix that is to change the aspect ratio within the settings to be 4x3. But by adjusting it to 4x3, you're going to create black bars on the sides, which is going to give you even smaller of a screen. So with a 4x3 in your settings on the RG351P, you're left with a 5.03 square inches, which is essentially a 3.2 inch display at that point and you're losing about 15% of screen real estate at that point. So that's something to consider is that the screen is significantly smaller on the RG351P than it is on the other two devices. Okay, now that we've talked about viewing angles as well as the size of the display, let's talk about the quality of the picture itself. So here's the Retroid Pocket 2, and this is on the Super Nintendo here, and you can see this is built for 4x3, and it looks great on this device. Everything looks crystal clear. I would say that the Retroid Pocket 2 display is a little bit warm for my taste, there's a little bit more yellow to it, as opposed to, say, for example, the 350M, which you see here, and it looks perfect. The coloring is great to me, and the pixels look good as well. Now here's the 351P, you can see it's a little bit squished because of the 3x2 aspect ratio, and it's a little bit softer looking, and that's because I'm using a setting called RGA scaling. And that basically adjusts your scaling to allow it to look a little bit sharper and a little bit more even on the display. Here it is with the RGA scaling off, and you can see it just looks a little bit weird. The pixels are a little bit squished or smashed, as opposed to something like the 350M, which just looks much more balanced. So overall, I use the RGA scaling setting, uh, even though it makes the image a little bit softer, and I have an entire screen configuration guide on my website, as well as on this YouTube channel, and I'll go way more into depth than that one. So if you have any issues about the 351P, I encourage you to look at that video, which I'll also have linked below. So overall, I think that all three of these displays are actually really nice, you know, especially compared to the displays from five or ten years ago. Um, but they all have their pros and cons, and so none of them are perfect. I would say overall, when it comes to just pure screen, I would say the 350M actually has the best looking screen out of all of them because it has the best viewing angles as well as the best colorization. And so that's just a personal preference, but I wanted to put this out there in case you had any questions about these things. All right, so let's dive into gameplay experience at this point. Let's start with some systems that won't even work on the RG350M, so for example, the Dreamcast. Now you can see here, they, they both perform about the same. You can see I have the frames per second on the top right here. And overall, you're getting about the same frames per second uh, on this Dreamcast game here, 
but again this really depends on the game itself and so it's not a one size fits all with any of these things but in general the games work pretty well on the 351p you have to go in and tweak some of the settings but overall they look pretty good but the moment you turn on the retroid pocket 2 onto a dreamcast game the 351p looks very amateurish and that's because dreamcast games look really really good in the retroid pocket 2. it's the perfect aspect ratio it's the perfect screen dimensions for this device itself and so because of that everything looks really nice and crisp this is one of my favorite things to do is to play Dreamcast games on the Retroid Pocket 2. Now just like with Dreamcast games, the Nintendo DS games seem to look a little bit better on the Retroid Pocket 2 than they do in the RG351P. Now just a word of caution though, neither of these devices do Nintendo DS very well because they don't have touch screens and so because of that it's you're very limited in the games that actually run well on this system but overall I would say they look better and they play better on the Retroid Pocket 2. Overall, I would say that PlayStation Portable is a mixed bag on these two devices, and that's because certain games will play well on one, and they won't play well on the other. Uh, and overall, too, the RG351P has had a lot of improvements on PSP just over the past few weeks, so it's really hard to say that one is better than the other. I will say that the 351P screen seems to me to look a lot better than it does on the Retroid Pocket 2, and that's because the aspect ratio is better suited for the 351P than it is for the Retroid Pocket 2's 640x480 display. And finally, Nintendo 64. Now, again, this is another system where not all of the games play very well on either of the systems, but I will say that the Retroid Pocket 2 seems to look better. It has the better aspect ratio, and you can actually get into the settings a little bit better with the Retroid Pocket 2 than you can with the RetroArch on the RG351P. So in general, even though neither of these games play perfectly on either of these systems, I would say that the Retroid Pocket 2 probably does Nintendo 64 a little bit better than the 351P. Okay, we've been at this for a while, so let's go ahead and start wrapping things up. And we'll start with the RG350M. Overall, this device can do emulation, starting all the way back to the Atari and all the way up to the PS1. Now I have asterisks here because not every PS1 game will play perfectly. There are a few that don't run very well. And even there are some Super Nintendo games that don't really run very well on this device either. And that's because some of them are just hard to emulate. But overall, this has a large library of different ports that you can play, which makes it a lot of fun to kind of find new games that you can play on this device. And it has a long history of support. The GCW0, which is a device this is based on, has been around since 2013, 2014. So there's a long history of development with this device in particular. It also has a nice premium aluminum finish, and I think that feels really good in the hand. It's a little bit heavy, but it's a nice heaviness. If I had one bad thing to say about this device, it's the fact that it's a little bit underpowered, especially compared to some of the devices that are coming out more recently. Now, that's not a bad thing, especially if you only want to play PS1 and below games. This is perfect for you. Uh, but in general, if you're trying to max performance and trying to see what you can get out of this device, this isn't the device for that. Overall, if I could summarize the RG350M into one sentence, it would be that it's good enough for classic gaming. And that doesn't sound like a very positive or glowing review, but what I mean by that is that if you are only focused on gaming up to the PS1 era and below, then this is the system for you. Because you don't have to worry about any of the other features or things like that, you can just enjoy this device and not have to worry about expectations of how well it plays Nintendo 64 or whether or not it can play the DS. If you're only worried about PS1 and below, this is going to be a lot of fun for you. So let's move on to the Retroid Pocket 2. Now this system can emulate everything up to the Nintendo 64, PlayStation Portable, Dreamcast, and Nintendo DS. Now I put an asterisk there because those four systems will not play at 100%. I would say expect about 50% performance from all four of those systems and you'll be okay. Now overall, I really like the fact that it uses the Android operating system because it gives you a lot of potential. You can go into the Google Play Store, you can find apps that work with the 6.0 version of Android, and you can just download them and play them right then and there. And to me, that's a really cool feature. Now this is the only device that is fully wireless, and I think that's pretty important because uh, it's the only device of these three that has built-in Wi-Fi as well as Bluetooth. And it allows you to do online over-the-air updates. You can go into RetroArch and you can update your cores. There are just a lot of neat things you can do with having a fully functioning wireless device. 
Now the Retroid Pocket 2 has a lot of value going for it. It only costs $80 in the Retroid store, although that also includes an additional $10, maybe even $15 for shipping. Uh, overall, you're going to pay less than $100 for a device that does a lot of things. Now, if I could summarize the things I don't like about the Retroid Pocket 2, I would have two complaints. And number one is the fact that I don't like the buttons or the controls on this device. The buttons feel very clicky. The D-pad doesn't feel great. The left analog stick is just okay. And the right digital stick is just kind of a waste. It's, it's no fun to me. And my second complaint is kind of minor, but I just wanted you to be aware of it, is the fact that the supply has not been able to keep up with the demand all the way back from August when this device first released. And so because of that, there's about a two month wait from the moment you buy the Retroid Pocket 2 to when it shows up on your door. So that's something to be aware of. That even if you buy it right now, you're not gonna see it until 2021. Now, if I could summarize this device into one sentence, it would be that it is good for tinkering. Now, what I mean by that is the fact that it does not work very well right out of the box. If you actually look at my first impressions video when I first opened up this device, I was super confused. I didn't know how to actually use this thing. And it took me a good month or so to really get a feel for how it worked and to basically configure it the way I wanted. And so in that sense, just be aware that if you do want this device, it is going to come with a little bit of work. But if you enjoy that aspect, you like really tweaking things, this might be a good fit for you. And finally, we have the RG351P. Now, uh, this also can do emulation up through the Nintendo 64, PSP, Dreamcast, and DS, but with that same caveat that it cannot play every single one of those games, I would expect about 50% performance. Now, I really love the interface on this device. It is very pick up and play. You can just pick it up and it's very intuitive and you know how to get to your system and pull up the game and then play it. Now another thing I like about this device is the fact that there are a lot of developers who are interested in it, which means that there are other people who are kind of tinkering with it and figuring out ways to make it better. Already in the past two weeks, we've seen two new operating systems crop up, which is really just kind of a fun idea. You know, the fact that people are just changing the way you fundamentally use this device and they're making it better every day. Now I've already talked about how I like the way this device feels, but overall I would say it has wonderful craftsmanship. I really enjoy picking up this device every time I think to myself, wow, this is really well balanced. I love the feel of the plastic on it. The buttons feel very sturdy. And even though the 350M has a more premium feel, I really enjoy the 351P better because I think that just nice plastic feel to it is more fitting to the games that I'm playing. Now, the one thing I don't like about this device, and it's a pretty big thing, is the fact that the 3x2 screen is only ideal for Game Boy Advance. Every other system requires a good amount of tweaking, and as I mentioned before, I have a screen configuration guide, which I'll link in the comments below, that'll allow you to tweak all of those things, but it is going to take a couple hours of work in order to get everything perfect. And if I could summarize the RG351P into one sentence, it would be that it is the best no-frills experience out there. And what I mean by that is the fact that you can just turn it on and you can get right into a game. And this is the system that I'm buying for my friends because it's so simple to set up. I can just ship it to me. I can take a day to set it all up for them. I can send it over to them. And I know that they'll be able to play it for years without having any additional questions. And I would not be able to do that with the Retroid Pocket 2 or the RG350M. And when it comes down to it, I love simplicity. I like things to be very simple and basic. And for me, the RG351P fits that bill perfectly. It's not a perfect system. I think the screen could be a lot better, but overall, this is the one that I pick up and play when I have the option. And before we close, I really want to reiterate the fact that the interface on the RG351P is really what sets it apart from the other two devices. Because in general, when you're on a device like this, you're going to spend the majority of your time going through the user interface. So you want that to be as ideal as possible. And to me, the simplicity of the RG351P's interface is exactly what I need for the amount of gaming that I want to do. You're going to get a lot of people out there to say, well, it can't do this game as well as the other, or maybe the screen isn't as good as the other one. And I understand and I respect all of those arguments. What I'm trying to say here is that sometimes the interface itself and the experience that I have with the device outweighs any of those kind of nitpicky feelings that I would have when it comes to whether or not it can play every game perfectly or whether or not it has the perfect screen. To me, overall, I prefer the RG351P over the RG350M as well as the Retroid Pocket 2. 
And you may not, and that's perfectly fine. You may find that some things are more important to you than others. But for me, it's the user interface as well as just the seamless user experience. I think it's worth taking a moment to consider the fact that for $100, you can buy a device that has a ton of features and that can play thousands of games, and it has a beautiful interface, and it has wonderful craftsmanship, all for under $100. To me, that's pretty amazing. Think about the fact that the original Game Boy cost hundreds of dollars, you had to use your own batteries for it, it wasn't even backlit, and you had to buy all those games individually as well. Here we have something that can do all of that and more for way less than what it originally cost, and it's so much fun to play, and it fits in your pocket too. Like, it's just so many cool things about these systems that I just wanted to take a moment to, to consider the fact that I love the fact that I have three great devices that I can compare against one another, and then I can have a winner, and I can have a loser, but when it comes down to it, all three of these systems are really excellent. So if you're asking for me, for my advice, of which system you are gonna need to buy, any of them are gonna be great. But for me personally, I'm going to buy the RG351P. Okay, everyone, that's the end of this video. I really appreciate that you stuck around and watched all the way to the end. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below. I tried to cover everything, but I'm sure I missed something. So please leave me a comment and I'd be more than happy to discuss it with you. If you're new to the channel, I would love it if you liked and subscribed. I'd really appreciate you joining me on this journey as I talk about retro video games. And I have a lot more content coming in the future. All right, everyone. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Happy gaming.